This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we've got a special guest on the podcast today. His name is Russell Berger. He is a former chief knowledge officer and spokesman for the fitness gym brand CrossFit, and he was fired in 2018 for tweeting in defense of a CrossFit franchise owner that canceled an LGBTQ pride-themed workout for religious reasons. So in the podcast, we go into the backstory just a little bit, but the gym in question is CrossFit Infiltrate in Indianapolis, and the gym's manager and the staff created an LGBTQ pride-themed workout that was going to be done during the first week of so-called Pride Week there in June of 2018. Now, that was the plan until the gym owner, a guy named Brandon Lowe, canceled the workout. So he sent out a statement. Uh, He emailed this out to all the gym members concerning the cancellation. Here was the statement. Our underlying goal for the staff and members at CrossFit Infiltrate and our other gyms is total health and well-being for the individual and community. Total health involves the body, the emotions, relationships, and the spirit. As the foundational detractor from health, as we believe God sets the parameters for, is pride. We believe the true health, that true health forever can be found within humility, not pride. Humility is seeing oneself as they truly are and as God truly defines them to be. As a business, we will choose to deploy our resources towards those efforts and causes that line up with our values and beliefs. So... Wouldn't you know it? Shock of all shocks. The woke LGBTQ mob didn't like this one bit. They came after him. It was kind of like this crazy thing that went on. All of his trainers and managers quit basically at the same time. And most of their clients canceled their memberships. And, you know, the harassment of the gym owner continued until he eventually had to close his gym down. And I think he had to close down his other gyms as well. Now, all that sounds like it was plenty dramatic and disruptive on its own. But everything kicked off uh, or kicked up a notch rather when CrossFit's Russell Berger, who again is a guest today he tweeted and i know we live in an era where when you tweet things that's like currency to people that hate you right but he tweeted support for crossfit infiltrates owner and his decision so here was the tweet as someone who personally believes celebrating pride is a sin i'd like to personally encourage crossfit infiltrate for standing by their convictions and refusing to host an pride workout essentially so he also tweeted that you know the tactics of the lgbtq movement uh towards dissent it's a clear and existential threat to the freedom of express of expression but um he he deleted those tweets and we we talked about some of the deleted tweets but then he did have this tweet that he put out later after he had you know deleted some and then added some more he said allow me to double down I believe indie pride is a celebration of sin, as do most Christians. I deleted this and reposted a different version to make sure it's clear these are my personal beliefs, you know, since the Twitter mobs are hard at at work trying to get me fired. So again, you know, there's kind of that line like, okay, is he tweeting on behalf of CrossFit or is he tweeting on behalf of his own personal opinions? But these tweets did put him in hot water with his employer CrossFit and within a few hours. You know, they they went from suspending him pending an investigation to basically coming out and firing him same day as all this stuff went down. The CrossFit CEO at the time, Greg Glassman, came out and actually called Berger a zealot. And it wasn't long again that before he was fired. It was just kind of this crazy, uh, dramatic thing. Now, he's one to tell you, and he'll tell you in this interview today, that that was a great experience for him. It got him out of a job that he was, you know, never going to leave, and it wasn't the best fit for him. He went into ministry, but he didn't always start out, you know, as a Christian. You know, he grew up as a a fairly... the egregious atheist or, you know, combative atheist, I guess you could say, and then found his way into agnosticism and then eventually found his way to Christ as well. And so in this interview, we, we talked through that entire situation, the process of being caught up in something like that. Why to even tweet? Does he regret it? What would he do differently if he could go back now? What it's like whenever you're being canceled. I mean, this is 2018. That seems like a million years ago. But what was it like back then when you're being canceled by these people that just hate you? Uh, And also, you know, what about diversity? Because CrossFit claims to be the super diverse brand, but apparently not diverse of all different types of opinions. And so we get into all that. We get into his ministry work that he's doing now. We talk a lot about, you know, masculinity inside the church and how discipleship and true masculine discipline is going to kind of lead to masculinity within the church. I really, really enjoyed my time with him today. So guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Russell Berger, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thanks for having me, Kyle. I'm I'm glad to be here. 
So let's, let's actually start early on in life. Cause we talked a little bit off air, but athleticism activity, that's kind of been a part of who you are, even as an adult, been a part of your career. And we'll, of course, get into all of that. You know, that's the stuff that I talked about in the intro, but let's talk about early life. Like, have you always been active? Have you always been athletic? Like what was, what was that connection for you? Cause like, I didn't grow up in a family of athletes. I was the only athlete. So it wasn't like I, you know, I came by it. Honestly, I just kind of fell into it. Yeah. I, I definitely didn't grow up in a family of athletes per se. Um, I grew up in uh, the Southeast. I bounced around a lot as a kid because my dad was in the Navy and everywhere we ended up living was uh, generally pretty rural and we usually had a lot of woods to play in. And so my athletic background is running around in the woods, climbing trees, throwing rocks at stuff and fighting other kids. So we're surprisingly, stuff, you end up as a fairly well not allowed to do kid. now. Yeah. You can't do that stuff now. I don't know if you Yeah, know exactly. I, no, I had like a real Tom Sawyer upbringing. Um, Okay. So that's, I mean, my athletic abilities and my backgrounds were really not sports based. It was just real play, you know, kids doing what kids do. So the idea of going outside without shoes on and running for two hours was just, I mean, that was just daily life. Uh, climbing trees, pull ups. Like I could always do pull ups as a kid because it's what I did every time we climbed stuff. Um, when I was a little older, uh, my grandfather got me into pole vaulting. He's a, a pole vaulting coach. And so every kid that comes through our family has to pole vault. It's sort of like a rite of passage. So I did that uh, during the summers for a few years. Um, I did some, you know, some t-ball as a kid, some, a little bit of uh, soccer. I, I didn't stick with anything. Uh, we didn't have the money for any kind of sport that required purchasing equipment. So there were a lot of things that were off the table. Uh and uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's really it. I didn't really actually start doing sports uh, in any sort of meaningful sense until high school. And even there, I was inconsistent. I didn't like to show up to practices on time. So I, it didn't work out for me. So. So I'm getting the sense that you're a bit of a knucklehead, but you know, at, and yeah. you kind of like kept that going on into adulthood, which is a good thing when we'll, we'll get to that, but also kind of a big part of your story, Russell is your personal faith. And so everyone kind of has their, when I became a Christian moment or realization, but for you, if, if I remember correctly, you also went to seminary, if I remember correctly from your bio. So I, I know we're just going to be scraping the surface on that part of it, but like Give me the 30,000 foot view about how you became a Christian and kind of how, like, and yeah, I guess correct the record if I, if I was incorrect about seminary, but yeah. how that's kind of been a central point of your entire life. Yeah. So I, I've attended seminary, uh, didn't graduate, just kind of started collecting classes here and there. Uh, but I did go to Bible college, um, rewinding many years. So as a kid, as you could kind of pick up, um, I was, I was stubborn and I was a contrarian. So if somebody told me there's a rule here, uh, don't do this. That was sort of like a personal challenge to see if I could do it without getting caught or how close to doing it I could I could get away with well, at, without actually breaking the rule. And so to be in the Bible Belt South uh, with that sort of character, I really, from a young age, uh, really very openly rejected Christianity. So I, mm. I had a lot of friends who were Christians, at least in name, uh, one of my friends growing up around the eight, nine years old, his dad was a pastor of a Methodist church. And uh, my mom at the time would, would kind of drag us along to small little Baptist churches on Sunday mornings. Um, and she was she's not a Christian, but she just sort of saw this as like the cultural thing to do in the South. And so every step of the way, I found reason to uh, dig my heels in and say, no, that's not me. Uh, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God. Uh, I don't want to be a part of that because that's just the thing that people do around me. And I've got to be different. Uh, my dad was an atheist. He was raised Roman Catholic and, and, and the Roman Catholic church produces a, a lot of good atheists is, is my experience. And so he, from a very early age, he was kind of discipling me in atheism, uh, kind of teaching me how to, how to be the free thinking, uh, rational kind of atheist that, that can, take down silly Christian arguments and expose it as just blind faith and foolishness. And that's the attitude I took. And I, I, I ran with that uh, all the way through my teenage years, uh, got out of high school, didn't really know what I was doing. Um, didn't have the money for college. Didn't have the aspiration to go to college. Saw a lot of my friends going to college and wasting time and, and doing stupid stuff I didn't want to be a part of. 
And so I joined the Army. This was uh, 2003, 2004, uh, just a couple years after uh, 9-11. And so I wanted to I wanted to go kill terrorists. And, and so I joined the army. Uh, I, I was uh, selected into first ranger battalion and uh, spent four years getting deployed every six months to 90 day deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, met my wife. We got married. I was living in Savannah, Georgia. And, and around this time, like there's just something about uh, living on, on the edge of death, <laughs> you know, hanging out of helicopters, getting shot at that just sort of, even as a very stubborn atheist, it just kind of, it, it, it calibrated my senses a little bit more towards agnostic, you know, having, having to face death and the thought of death made me just a little bit more open to, to the reality of, you know, maybe I will meet a creator uh, someday. Uh, maybe there, maybe there is someone who is behind all of this, who, uh, who is, who's keeping me alive right now. Uh, so after that, I got out, Kind of had the American dream. I had a house. I had a wife. We had, we had a, two little babies at home. Had a good job. I was working for uh, CrossFit. And really, at that point in my life, I was making a tremendous idol out of my job and out of my athletic success. And those two went pretty close together because it was it was CrossFit. And I put so much of my time and my effort and my talent into being the best at my job and being the best athlete that I was really leaving my family kind of high and dry. And uh, at a time when my wife, with, with two little babies at home, and she was starting to have some health issues, she really needed me there, and my, my kids needed me there, and I was just not there for them. And out of nowhere, I got hit with the overwhelming conviction that I was in sin, which as an atheist really didn't, it didn't make sense. Right. right? I, here I am, an atheist. I'm captain of my own destiny. Uh, there is no God. I am just a, uh, I'm a, I'm a combination of pieces of stardust banging around in a universe governed by time and blind chance. And here I am feeling like there's some rule that applies to me and my behavior that I didn't agree to that, that does not comport with an atheist's worldview. And yet I couldn't shake it. So this was a thing that I didn't want to believe. And I didn't think I believed. And yet I had this, this external, moral conviction that I was in sin and that I would someday give an account for my sin and the way that I was treating my wife and my kids. And I spent about two or three months just in, in this terrible state of anxiety and frustration and, and just not really sure how to deal with that. Uh, and then I actually was doing a CrossFit competition. It was one of the regional competitions to go to the CrossFit Games and uh, I had a terrible time and, and I was still wallowing in this, this anxiety and this, this feeling of moral guilt that I couldn't shake. Uh, and I met uh, Rich Froning, who was a uh, you know, multiple CrossFit Games champion. At the time, nobody knew who he was. He hadn't won anything yet. Mm. And uh, he was a Christian. And when I saw him, I had a little bit of like a jealousy. Like this guy is very similar in his desires to just be the best but he's not wearing it around like an idol. And I didn't know that word, but I knew the difference. Like he was content with what God was giving him. He was content to win or lose. And he had, he had sort of this peace about him that I was really, I was envious of. And so even in my desire to kind of know God and, and him drawing me to himself, it was still governed by selfish ambition. You know, I wanted things that would make me feel better. Uh, it just goes to show that, <laughs> Like we're, we're sinners through and through. So, so I realized like, okay, if he's got this sense of peace and he seems like the kind of guy I want to be, maybe that would be the solution to this anxiety I'm feeling, this, this guilt. And so I started reading my Bible. And so every night when I was putting my infant son to bed, I would open up the Bible by a headlamp and I would start reading. Uh, and I read through Genesis. I, I read through the Old Testament. I got into the New Testament. I, I didn't have anybody tell me how to read the Bible. So I just treated it like any old book, you know, page one, page two, page three. And uh, as I was reading it, I unmistakably heard God speaking to me, which I didn't expect as an atheist either. You know, I, I was reading it and realizing this is a different kind of book than I've ever read. Um, I It had an authority and it had a cohesion to it that I didn't expect. And I hadn't read the Bible. I, I had a Bible on my shelf since I was a teenager and never opened it up, despite all of my 
claims that I knew Christianity in and out and knew how false and foolish it was. I never actually read my Bible. Hmm. Yeah. So when I read it, I, I was convicted of its truth. Uh, I, I didn't really know what to make of that, though, because I didn't have anybody discipling me. I'd never had the gospel presented to me clearly. So as I'm reading it, I'm sort of starting to get the picture of what the gospel is. But it still took many months of, of me sort of fumbling through the pages of scripture before I heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Uh, and so I'm not even really sure when in there I was saved. But, but when I was, I realized that I moved from, from thinking, okay, these things are true, right? So there's, there's at least six months where I, I decided Christianity was true. But I wasn't really a Christian. Right. The, the, the idea that you believe it's true and that makes you a Christian uh, is not really biblical. Um, you know, James says even even the demons know that God exists and they shudder. But when I recognize that Christ had died for me and that if I trusted in him and believed on him and, and put my my love and affection and my trust in his person and in his work, that all that he accomplished for sinners would be applied to me. That's when I really changed and my, my life changed. My wife could see it. People who used to know me could see it. Uh, and that process was slow and it was painful. And I don't know exactly when it happened, but it was over about the course of a year. Uh, and so from there, I went to Bible college. I, I was still not in a healthy church. I didn't have anybody discipling me. So I figured, hey, I got the GI Bill. Uh, I pulled out of the secular uh, school that I was in and I started going to Bible college. And, and uh, the rest is history there. Well, I really appreciate you going into all that detail because I know a lot of people have been on a similar journey, I guess you could say. Uh, one quick thing, and I don't want to divert too much from from what I wanted to talk about today. Yeah. But you mentioned something early on there, Russell, about Catholicism and yeah. how you know a lot of people that are – it's almost like people that are culturally Jewish – but yes. they have no connection to the Jewish faith. That there's something very similar to that within Catholicism, where you're raised Catholic, but you have nothing even fathomably close to a, a belief in in even God, much less the gospel. And yeah. you, even you have people like Joe Biden that are good Catholics, and but they they believe in things and advocate for things that are literally antithetical to what we see in Scripture. Talk yeah. to me just a little bit more about that, because I know some some truly devout Catholics, Catholics that give me a hard time for being Protestant and I give it right back to them. But they, there seemingly is a, a massive problem with cultural Catholicism. Yeah. Uh, so anytime we talk about Catholicism, it's important to not talk about it as a monolith, as if everyone who is Roman Catholic believes and thinks the same things or even believes and thinks the things that uh, the Catholic Church teaches. So there's a lot of diversity within Roman Catholicism, much <laughs> Much to their chagrin, uh, the, the, the main thing is that the, the, the gospel as taught formally by the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church is a false gospel. And that's why we had the, the Protestant Reformation, which, uh, which split with the Catholic Church over the distinction between uh, God's grace being necessary for our salvation, which both Protestants and Catholics would agree with, versus God's grace being sufficient for our salvation, which only Protestants believe, and it's what the Bible teaches. Now, having said that, I know Catholic, Roman Catholics who I, I think are Christians who believe the true gospel, and that's not because of the teaching of the Catholic Church. It's to, that's in spite of the Catholic Church's uh, formal teaching. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, there's a lot of diversity within the Roman Catholic Church, but Roman Catholicism has also for, for centuries been sort of at the, the forefront of the, the culturally Christian nominalism that we now see all over the Bible Belt. Uh, so people who are who call themselves Roman Catholic, what they'll often mean is that's, that's my tribe, right? That's my family. Those are the people who I identify with. That's how I was raised. Right. But there is no personal saving faith or conviction. Uh, they've perhaps never even read their Bible, uh, which I've, I've encountered Catholics who, who didn't really know much about the Bible at all. Because like... Like modern Jews, you know, it's just it's a it's almost their ethnicity, it's their tribe, and so when you you know when you interact with Catholics, it's always good to ask them personally, what do you believe? What do you mean by saying you're a Catholic or you're a Christian? And I think the thing that's important as well is you need to listen earnestly, and you need to listen from like almost like an intellectually neutral position to just understand kind of where they're coming from. Because I know within Protestantism there are so many different denominations that say things differently. Mm -hmm. Like if you were to walk into a 
oh goodness, like maybe a uh, more reformed Baptist type circle. And if you were to say something like, I accepted Jesus into my heart, they would look at you like you had a boob on the top of your head. They'd be like, what, what does that mean? You accept it? Are you like the best acceptor ever? Like, you know, it, it, when you use different language, people are going to kind of c- come to it a little bit differently. Yeah. But I do want to talk a little bit more about uh, you introduced that, that you worked for CrossFit. Mm-hmm. So you were a CrossFit athlete, you were competing in CrossFit, but you also worked there. You were the chief knowledge officer, but mainly the reason why people that are outside of the, the CrossFit community came to know your name is because of something that happened in June of 2018. And I'll flow on in a little bit and then you can fill in details here and there. But essentially there was a CrossFit gym or box called CrossFit Infiltrate in Indianapolis. And they were planning to do a pride themed workout again, June, June is pride month you know, all the things that come along with that. And it gets worse and worse every year, but the gym owner. So, so the person that planned it, as far as I understand it was a manager of the gym and the staff and trainers at the gym planned this pride themed workout, but the owner of the gym, Brandon Lowe canceled the workout. Okay. And he, you know, sent a letter or an email out to the community, basically saying uh, that, that we're not going to be doing this. And he gave his reasons for that, but you came out and tweeted in support of Brandon Lowe. And there were people like, wait a minute, is, you know, is Russell tweeting on behalf of CrossFit? Is he, is he tweeting as just an individual that can have his own opinions and has free speech to do so? But you publicly came out and you touched the third rail, as it were, and you came out in support of somebody that was anti, not people that celebrate LGBTQ, but anti the celebration of pride in and of itself, specifically in that context. So let's go back there. And I've got several questions about some things that happened in there, but tell me about what it was like, how you found out about what CrossFit Infiltrate did, why you decided to tweet about it, and then we'll work from there. Uh, Yeah, I don't, I don't want to disappoint. There's not much to it. Uh, Mm. Yeah. I got on Twitter one morning and I saw uh, a bunch of shrill, LGBTQ activists attacking one of our CrossFit affiliates. Um, Not only was it my job in the company to defend our CrossFit affiliates, but uh, I was personally sympathetic to the owner as a Christian. Mm. And so I tweeted that I supported him and that pride was a sin. And the, this was in the heyday, the very early days of Twitter activism. And I was, Mm one of the very first people that the LGBTQ mob, as it's come to be known, uh, targeted for, uh, I don't know, they call it canceling now. They just want me fired. Yeah. And uh, so they fired me and, well, they didn't fire me. They, they called for me to be fired and the pressure was so enormous uh, from externally that internally people buckled and started sort of demanding the CEO fire me. And it within a matter of hours, he had, so... So I want to dig more into that, certainly, Mm -hmm. but I want to go back to even just the thought to tweet things because, you know, growing up, because we're about the same age, growing up, there was no stream of consciousness to put your opinions out there because if you had a thought, you left it in your brain because they're like, maybe you had a Zanga page or something like that, but there was nowhere to kind of put that thought. Whereas now we have stream of consciousness, Twitter, where we can just, oh, I have this thought and we can fart it out onto the internet. But yeah. you put these tweets out there, obviously the, the mob immediately, you know, just like white blood cells attacking a virus or something, they just, whoom, they swarmed you, yeah. but you deleted your tweets. You deleted some of them and then you put up a, another one. I guess take me back to that time period and, and we'll get into the firing and all the, the hubbub that happened there. But if you could go back, would you leave up all the tweets would you have even tweeted anything to begin with? Would you have taken a different tact? Because I think I saw somewhere where you, I read that you regretted tweeting it out to begin with, but I just want to kind of get it from you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So after I tweeted it, uh, I, I did delete the tweets and I deleted them because my, my company asked me to. Hmm. Uh, this was prior to them threatening to fire me. Uh, so we, we didn't have any policies at CrossFit for using personal social media accounts. So uh, there were no rules about how I could and couldn't tweet whatever I wanted on social media. Uh, But more than once, like I was saying things as a CrossFit spokesperson from my personal accounts, and and that was actually encouraged. And I would say things and, you know, there'd be feedback from other executives in the company and say, hey, don't say it that way. Say it this way. So I delete it and rewrite it. 
And this was one of those instances where they thought, okay, you've kind of kicked the hornet's nest. Uh, you need to delete that. And because I'm talking to people who I respect as colleagues and they're saying delete it, I was fine to delete it. Um, had I known they were going to fire me, I would have kept it up. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't yeah. deleting it in any sense that like I disagreed or regretted the words that I said. It's right. that I was trying to help out my company to not basically have to put out fires that nobody really wanted to be putting out. Um, yeah, again, looking back, had I seen the writing on the wall and, and seen that they were going to fire me, yeah, I, I definitely would have del not have deleted those tweets. Um, and then I, I did repeatedly say that I regretted putting my company in a position where they felt like they had to defend as an like and as an organization uh, my particular views, which our our CrossFit was full of diverse political and religious views. And so to put them in a position where they felt like they had to distance themselves from me and explain their position on gay pride, which like what company needs a position on gay pride? Like these days you have to, but back then it was a thing like companies don't step into that realm. It's a company, um, which sounds so foreign these days. But, you know, in 2018, like you could still be a company and not have a rainbow flag emoji uh, on all your posts in June. So, uh, yeah, I regretted putting a lot of my coworkers in, the, in that position where they were like, man, I, I did not want to wake up this morning and have to tell the world how I feel about gay stuff and, you know, put out a, a position statement on this. So I, I regretted that for their sake. I in no way regret and have never regretted uh, my position saying pride is a sin. Um, could I go back and redo it differently? No, I, I wouldn't. Uh, there are no what ifs in God's universe. Uh, he sovereignly ordains everything that comes to pass. And looking back now, I can see how he used that for tremendous good for, uh, for me and my family. It's probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Uh, I didn't love that job. And it was one of those jobs where it was too good to quit. I never would have quit. Uh, and, and because I got fired, it really opened up an opportunity for me to do ministry, which I'd been doing as a lay elder in my church and had wanted to be doing more. Uh, and because they fired me illegally, I had severance, which I never would have, never would have gotten otherwise. Um, and so I had the ability to transition into ministry in a way that it worked for my family. Um, yeah. And, you know, one of the highlights of that whole thing was I got I got interviewed by a lot of mainstream news sources. And mm. because I'd worked a lot with the media uh, and I knew, the, <laughs> I knew the tricks that they employ, I was able to really kind of pin some of them down to print some exact statements without manipulating them. And like at the Washington Post, I think it was, uh, printed like a, a word for word what I said, and it was, a, it was a clear proclamation of the gospel. So there's some really good fruit that came from that, uh, despite it being an absolute mess in some ways. So I wouldn't change it. Gotcha. So I want to go back to something that you said there, Russell, about CrossFit having, you know, a diverse type, many diversities of types of people and, and mm -hmm. backgrounds and all that, that worked actually at CrossFit yeah. because the official CrossFit Twitter sent out this tweet the day that you were fired. Mm -hmm. CrossFit is a diverse community in every way. And that's what makes us strong. No Almost. matter who you are, how you're built, what you believe, or who or how you love. We are proud of you. And so it seems like, Unless you're be shocked to know. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like they have diversity for everyone except for conservative Christians yeah. or just Christians in general. It's, it's, it's a diversity of immutable characteristics and lifestyle choices, but not diversity of thought. So talk to me a little bit more about that because that is, that is at 6 45 PM the day all this, uh, you know, kerfuffle started. Right. Yeah. And so like, uh, imagine thinking that, that, oh, we, we work in this very diverse place. And then you're literally fired because your version of diversity goes outside of what they feel is acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not terribly surprising. Um, that statement wasn't terribly surprising. I know it was, it's, it was just sort of a canned predictable PR move. Uh, you know, somebody looked around and said, Hey, uh, what are, what are big companies doing when somebody gets accused of, uh, being a bigot and, oh, they say something like this. And so they threw that up there to appease the mob. Uh, and that's, that's the whole motivation. Like, what does the mob want to hear? Well, the mob wants to hear something like this. So that's where you get that statement. Um, the internal inconsistency of that statement, just the utter foolishness of saying, 
we're such a diverse and accepting group of people that we have to fire someone who is not fitting the mold of what we believe. Right. And it's, it's self-evidently absurd. Uh, it's self-contradictory. And But that's the thing. No one cares about whether it's self-contradictory because we're not looking for uh, rational, logical consistency in, in this world. We're looking for emotivism, right? We want to say the right virtue signaling things that will appease the right group of people. And emotion dictates that, not reason. And I think the, the thing that's important for that is, again, you have someone that went to school for PR, they went to university for PR and they're just like, okay, we need to follow the mold because everything doesn't fall into the, you know, what Tylenol did with the cyanide poisoning back in the day. Like we kind of live in different times, but something that you talked about earlier is just overall what, what Twitter activism became. Okay. Because again, 2018 seems like it may as well be a billion years ago because that's pre COVID that's pre George Floyd. That's pre this, that's pre that. And this was really at a time when Mm. you didn't have every single sports franchise changing their logo on Instagram in the month of June. Right. So you, there's not a sport where you can get away from it, whether you're, you're watching the NBA or F1, everybody has to show their, their woke LGBTQ bona fides during this time period. But let's go back if we can to 2018 and the way back machine. What was it like specifically when the LGBTQ plus mafia came after you, because again, today we kind of know what it looks like. They, they, they call and try to cancel your advertisers. If you're Tucker Carlson, or they'll, they'll try to get you fired from your job, or they'll just basically smear you in the media because they know that you basically can't sue them for libel or slander. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't surprising to me. I've worked in social media for CrossFit for a couple of years and doing some kind of, kind of novel stuff. That, I mean, at the time it was. Now, it's just how people use social media. But we, we saw a lot of what was building up. Uh, I say we, me and my coworkers in, in social media there at CrossFit, we saw a lot of the bad ways that social media was trending. Uh, in particular, like the, the advent of the retweet mm. uh, and the way you started being able to reverberate sentiments and create these, the swarming effect around certain ideas and posts and shared posts, uh, what, it do, what it did and what we recognized pretty early that it was doing is it amplifies a very shrill minority and gives the illusion that they are the majority. Um, mm-hmm. And we see this all the time now. And I think few people really understand the significance of what, I, what I'm saying. And that is you can take a hundred people that have nothing to do all day today except share and comment and downvote and threaten related to some particular Twitter storm. And that hundred people can convince multi-million dollar companies that the world hates them. And yet there's thousands and thousands of people who are more reasonable, have stuff to do with their daily life, probably don't care enough to comment on issues either way, who are silently observing. But those companies only see the negative interactions, and so they get the sense that everyone hates us. We have to do something. And so the, the, the virtue signaling mafia, LGBTQ mafia, like the swarm effect that they are able to, to, to use, and, and it's really not just them. There's, there are people who do this in every part of the ideological spectrum with social media. Uh, it really is just a shrill minority. In most, most instances, people would do best to just ignore them and make them go away. Uh, and you started to see that the amplification was even even more built on by the media who stopped reporting on news and started reporting on the the things on Twitter people were talking about, that that had become the news. So rather than there being a news event, oh, and by the way, people here are upset about it, the news events were the upset people on Twitter. Right. So you get a, a double effect there where now the mainstream corporate media is doubling down on this amplification effect. And and really, like, I I went out uh, when I worked for CrossFit and we documented some of this. We would go count, look look at some of these Twitter storms where people were getting outraged about something and look at the media's response. And then we'd go back retrospectively and we'd count how many original users on Twitter were actually contributing to these things. And it would be something like 100, 200. Yeah, right. It's a handful of people who who are bringing companies to their knees. 
And so these companies have all bowed to the, the idol of social justice and LGBTQ ideology because their perception is so skewed by their fixation on social media as the new public square. And, and there are thousands upon thousands of Americans who want nothing to do with that. They stay out of that stuff that are just the, sort of the silent majority, as it's been called. But we're getting kind of ticked off with that. Mm. And, and I think you're starting to see some of that, like with Bud Light. Um, it's a good example of the, the blowback there. Well, so Russell, I, I literally wrote down Bud Light and I wrote down Adidas and we'll, we'll see with Adidas. But uh, one, one comment to what you were saying there is a lot of these, a lot of people in general want to be thought nice. They yeah. want to be thought of as nice and accommodating. And that leads to a whole host of negative things. I was even thinking the other day about how do we get this generation of people that can't lose? Like they literally just like if if someone tries to push against them, it's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Well, it's because well-meaning people were like, well, well, kids won't be able to develop self-esteem if they lose yeah. when literally the exact opposite is true is you only develop self-esteem when you accomplish something that you worked towards. Like I've been on teams that won zero games and I've been on championship undefeated teams and you learn a lot from both of those circumstances, but you need both of those circumstances. But let's talk a little bit about uh, what's happening. We've seen with Bud Light, we've seen what happened with Dylan Mulvaney and that's still that's going to have reverberations for, for months, if not years within the brand of Anheuser-Busch and the greater brand of maybe even beer in general. Everyone kind of knows what happened in that situation, but conservatives said, you know what? Screw you guys. We're, we're not, we're not playing this game. Like I can buy cheap beer from somebody else. And you know, some people are like, this isn't that big a deal. Why, why are they doing this? But it was like, I, and I've said this for a while, Russell, conservatives and Christians have been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and their backs are against the wall. And used to, it was like, hey, you see, you, you better not keep pushing me, see, or, or you'll make me angry, you see. And now it's like, no, we're going to start pushing back. And as I told you off air, Undaunted Life is here to equip men to push back darkness. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you go around constantly looking for a fight, but when a fight brings itself to your front door, you're ready to throw down. And so conservatives are pushing back on Bud Light and they're not buying Bud Light. We'll see how that goes. Adidas, they have male models that are modeling their women's swimwear. So dudes with dicks and balls are sitting there with their big bulges inside of women's, you know, mm -hmm. swimwear. And so it's like, well, Adidas isn't going to think about changing that unless they lose 20% of uh, their sales overnight, unless they lose billions of dollars worth of market valuation, basically yeah. in a quarter. Talk to me a little bit more about what Christians and conservatives can do, because you have some people out there, Russell, that are like the Benedict option people. They just want they want to be completely outside of culture. They don't want to be salt and light. They don't want to preserve culture. They want to be outside of it. They want to you know, make their own shoes and they want to do their own thing. And they don't actually want to push back in the fight inside of culture. I knew I threw I threw a lot out there, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh <clears throat> I guess one of my first thoughts when we start approaching the subject of Christians interacting with culture is, uh, is local. You know, you're not, you're not going to change America, but you might change your, your neighborhood and you might change the attitudes of people in your local church. Uh, you might get all the people in your county to change policies at the local schools. Uh, you may, in fact, gut your local schools and start everybody's in Christian homeschool co-ops, which would be my dream come true. Uh, but, you know, there's there's so much you can accomplish at the local level. Like I would love to make local politics great again. I would love to see a lot more autonomy and a lot more uh, experimental uh, policy done at the local level. I think we already see this nationally with, with what's happening in the states. You know, there's a huge it, I mean, back when I was a kid, uh, you know, looking back at the politics of, of the United States, like basically every state was kind of the same. In, in most ways. Now you have states on, on the extreme ends of the spectrum uh, from Florida and Texas and, and Tennessee on, on the right to California and New York and Washington on the left. You have, you have some pretty wide ranges of diversity politically. Mm. Uh, and then when you get down to county level, it only gets more diverse. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan of focusing locally. Uh, when it comes to dealing with with big woke companies and their, their silly shenanigans. Uh, you know, there's, I'm not a huge fan of, of taking to the, the Twitter sphere to do the same thing that the, the woke culture warriors are doing and just haranguing people through social media. I, I feel like that's just spinning wheels and wasted effort. 
uh, I, I like to just encourage people to think about making sacrifices and putting their money where their values are. Uh, and it's surprising how many people will be on paper utterly opposed to Adidas for their you know, blending and, and, and basically their, their disdain for God's design for gender. And yet they'll go out and buy Adidas shoes for their kids the next day. Uh, mm. You know, they just, you, you really do have to start making small sacrifices and taking stands on the small things uh, before you're going to see any effect in any big way. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many Christians I know that have Disney Plus subscriptions. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's freedom of the conscience. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell them they're wrong for that. But me personally, I, I think Disney's vile enough that I'm okay not watching even some awesome Star Wars stuff. So I'm told. You know, I, I'm willing to give that up. And as long as we're more interested in being entertained uh, than we are, you know, basically voting with our wallets, I don't see Disney going anywhere or changing a whole lot. So... So, you know, I, I tend to think of like the every man kind of approach. I don't have any big grand schemes for overthrowing uh, the, the hegemony of, of the pagan sexual cult that seems to be running our country. Uh, but like everyday things that we can do, like every man can do, are spend your money in the right ways where your values are, get involved in local politics and school your children in a way that you want them schooled and discipled. And I think it's important with that as well. People will say things like, well, I can't put Bud Light out of business, so I'm just going to buy Bud Light. It's like, you're right. You individually cannot put Bud Light out of business, but you yeah. get to choose where you spend your dollars. Yeah. You get to choose where you point your attention. You get to choose how you influence your children. And yeah. so years ago, when I found out that Starbucks was a massive donor to Planned Parenthood, it's like, I don't even drink coffee. But it was like, in our household, we will not support Starbucks. And people were like, well, that's crazy. Like, you know, this organization does it too. And this organization does it too. And it's like, look, I'm going to be held responsible for what I know about, not what I don't know about. Yeah. And whenever there is a brand out there that I didn't know support something that I think is heinous and egregious, that's another opportunity for me to say, Hey, we're, we're not going to spend our money there. We're not going to support that. Right. And everything there, there is a threshold with everything. You have to do things within reason. If you're in a town that only has a target and you need medicine for your kid and you know, that type of scenario, okay. Yeah. Ignore the chest binders as you walk by to get your, your kids some medicine. There is a greater good yeah. here, but you're absolutely right that the inconsistency, the people that want to just rail on the woke mob and oh, they're coming after our kids, but it's like, you're funding them coming yeah. after your kids. That's the difference. It's kind of like the Great Commission. Um, you know, every Christian is told, essentially, by Jesus through his words in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How are you doing at that? Well, not everyone needs to be a missionary to unreached peoples in Papua New Guinea, but day to day, are you putting your resources, your, your time, your talent, your treasure into a church that is supporting that? Are you taking opportunities to, to share the gospel with people who you know in daily life aren't Christians? You know, what are those little things that you can do just to be faithful where you are? That's the same principle, I think, is just take what you've been given, be faithful where you can, and leave it to God to, to fulfill the bigger picture through people like you. Right. And you, you say that on a local level, uh, you, you talked about things being local. Cause again, we focus on national politics, but we don't know what the name of our mayor is. Like that's right. kind of the, the, the consistency or the, the, I guess, environment that we live in now, Yes, but let's, let's talk a little bit about ministry, a little bit more about ministry. Cause yes, you can have a tremendous impact in your house, in your neighborhood, in your small group, in your church, in your local community, as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, changing how politics is done in Washington, DC. So yeah. after CrossFit, you know, you go through all that, everything kind of chills out for a little bit, then you get more into ministry and you've kind of kept that momentum going through even to today. So you've been doing that for the last, you know, five ish years or so. Yeah. Talk to me about ministry. Talk to me about the stuff that you're working on now. Uh, yeah. So I was, I mean, I was, a, as I said, my testimony, I was a Christian for a while before I had any real discipleship. Um, mm -hmm. it, I bounced around uh, the country working for CrossFit, ended up in some different churches of varying degrees of health, uh, really never in a healthy church, um, meaning there were churches I was in where I was hearing the gospel, but they, they really were not uh, being faithful to scripture in regards to like 
church membership, uh, helping people to apply the gospel to their lives, the, you know, the one another commands throughout the New Testament, um, even even in some of the, the secondary issues of the faith, things that aren't gospel imperatives, but some theological uh, things that come from just being a church that they just weren't encouraging us to think through that. Uh, some of the, some of those things were wrong. So I finally bounced around enough uh, in churches to realize, okay, there's got to be more to what God has instituted, this local church, than showing up and sitting in a dark room to watch a rock band perform and then hearing a 30 minute TED talk that seems more about therapeutic use of the gospel than what the Bible is actually saying. And so that's when I started trying to learn what the church is. Uh, I met a really solid brother who's now my senior pastor at Sixth Avenue, uh, Sean DeMars. Uh, We actually met doing some, so I was doing some ministry outside of our local abortion clinic and we met on the sidewalk out there. He knew of me from CrossFit. Uh, and so we, we hit it off pretty quickly. And uh, he kind of gave me some resources to help me think through biblically, what should a church look like? How can a church be faithful to scripture and not just be there to entertain and please itching ears? And uh, he ended up coming back after doing a, a, an internship in DC. He, he came back and started pastoring a church in Decatur. And I joined as one of the early members there and uh, served as a lay elder for a few years, this was this is around the time I got fired from CrossFit, um, and then I went off from there to do the same internship at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in D.C. So I lived on Capitol Hill, like inside of the Supreme Court in the Capitol Building, for uh, about nine months, um, and came back to Huntsville, Alabama, around the time COVID started, which was an enormous blessing from God because I would have been arrested in DC within a month of the COVID lockdowns. And uh, so we were in pretty laid back Alabama where I would just not wear a mask and people would give me mean looks and I would just laugh and no one cared. So, you know, we, in, in this environment at this time, my wife had some pretty serious health issues. She was on a list for uh, intestinal transplant. She had multi-organ failure. Uh, she was, then moved under like palliative care, sort of a sort of a step before hospice where you're basically just saying this person's going to die. How can we make them comfortable? And so I was her I was her caregiver uh, full time. I didn't work really for a while because I couldn't. Um, and then in the Lord's kindness, uh, we had some pretty big break, breakthroughs. She she had an immunologist diagnose her with a with sort of the source of her organs being killed. It was this thing called angioedema. It's, it's kind of in the family of allergic reactions, but it's not the same. And they got her this crazy expensive drug uh, that took like three months to get approved through insurance that uh, she just injected and once a week. And, and it kind of kept her symptoms at bay. So she went into remission. Uh, she's in the last year, she's got her driver's license back. She's got quality of life back. She's doing pretty well. Uh, despite not having any organs, she's still dependent on uh, TPN. Like she has no digestive tract really. So she's dependent on her nutrition coming through a line that goes right to her heart. So she's frail. She's got a lot of health issues, but she's way more independent than she was. And so I've been free to uh, to work again. And so I did some secular work for about a year uh, just because I needed a job. Uh, it, it basically became untenable. Uh, and Everybody I knew was like, yeah, you really should be in ministry. Uh, that's why you're miserable. And so in, in God's providence, the church had an opportunity and the funding and the need to hire me. And so I've been working as a, an assistant pastor at Sixth Avenue Church for like a week now. And prior to that, I was a pastoral assistant until the, the church had voted to ordain me. Okay, very good. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that things are going better for your wife. Obviously, that's, I mean... We could talk a whole lot more about that, but that seems absolutely yeah. terrifying when you also have kids and, you know, you have to, you know, you like to eat food and live indoors. Like that's yeah, a lot of stress to, to have. But um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about church and about ministry, yeah. because one thing that's I guess you could call it a calling card of Undaunted Life is we will call out uh, cowardice and effeminacy inside of churches, inside of uh, ministries, inside of individual men. And we want to there's kind of this clanging bell of men's ministries that like everything they do is about let's eat meat and let's go sleep on the ground. Let's go do all that. And it's like, that stuff's fine. Like I I'm, I'm all for a lot of that stuff, 
but they're not getting the buy-in from the men of their churches. And then you have churches that if they do quote unquote men's ministry at all, what they mean by that is once a year, we're going to do a cookout and we're going to do a chili cook-off and we're going to bring in an ex-football player to come in and talk about how he used to, you know, snort Coke off of strippers bottoms. And, and now he doesn't do that anymore because of Jesus, right? Like that's, that's kind of what men's ministry is, but then they go the other 364 days of running a church and the church itself is not man friendly. And so when churches talk to me and ask me about, you know, how do we get our men engaged and how we do all this? I'm like, well, first of all, don't pretend like you have a men's ministry. You don't. Second of all, don't even try to build a men's ministry because it's not going to work. Build a man-friendly church from top to bottom, from the man on stage, the senior pastor with the microphone attached to his face, to the music that is sung, the lyrics in those songs, the key that they are sung in, maybe make it a key that a, a man can actually hit. And that is like really having an impact on churches to where they're like, for the first time ever, they're like, oh my gosh, I've never even considered the fact that the lyrics of this song sound homoerotic to a guy. That's why he doesn't know why, but he just sits there with his hands in his pockets because the song's making him deeply uncomfortable. But talk to me a little bit about just really the state of manhood inside of Christ church. You know, I guess we'll keep it specifically to America. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. That's, uh, that's a broad subject. So just some thoughts right off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I think evangelical churches tend to fall into some common tropes. Uh, you know, you see it every Mother's Day. Um, a, a church will make a huge ordeal out of Mother's Day, just fawning over the sacrifice of mothers, how important they are, this and that, uh, which is, I think, I think good. But then you, you see them do the same thing on Father's Day, and Father's Day is admonishing fathers for never doing enough and not being there enough. You know, there's this kind of this, this, uh, this, this sentiment, this posture towards men that I think is more reflective of the culture we live in than it is of anything biblical. Uh, and I've seen that from time to time uh, within evangelical churches. You know, I, I also think I know what you're talking about with some of the effeminacy. Um, you know, there so many churches are, are their philosophy of ministry is how many people can we get in a building? If we can get a bunch of people in this building, it will be a successful church. And we measure the health of our church by how many people are showing up on a Sunday morning. Well, there's a lot of stuff you can do to get people to show up in a building that's not biblical, that's not faithful to God, that doesn't convict anyone of sin, that doesn't save anyone. Uh, it just gets people to show up. And one of the things people love is just uh, sort of feel-good therapeutic emotionalism. You can get a lot of people in a building for that, but a lot of the people you get in the building won't be your typical men uh, who don't thrive on therapeutic feel-good emotionalism. So I think some of what we're seeing is that it's not that the church is necessarily making men effeminate or not, uh, you know, not considering more masculine men. It's just it's that they've, their philosophy of ministry is so warped that those men just aren't interested in what they're giving. Uh, and so I think one of the, the solutions, just to go back to sort of what I talked about earlier, is just making churches healthier. So if you have a church that is not offering feel-good, therapeutic, entertaining versions of the gospel, and that just preaches God's word, that starts with telling men who they are in God's sight, both as image bearers of God created distinctly from women with God-given masculine roles and God-given masculine attributes God-given masculine strengths and God-given masculine weaknesses, uh, that we are, um, you know, a, a very strong complementarian theology is going to make both women and men want to hear more from God's word about what it means to be male and female. And then on top of that, telling men that they're sinners as God sees them, you know, they're in need of a savior, in need of uh, a sacrifice to atone for their sin and in need of the righteousness of Christ. That is across all of humanity, uh, a truth that applies to every man. And when those things are missing or you, or you water that down and make it more of an individual therapeutic sort of expression of, of what the message of the gospel is, you're not going to have things that, that men want. Um, and I think, I think you can even see that 
even if the church is trying really hard to have like a type A, super macho, masculine men's ministry, you know, hey guys, we're going to go out and we're going to lift some weights and we're going to go on a hike and then we're going to shoot some guns. And then we're going to sit around and we're going to talk about this, this parable Jesus taught, but we're going to completely miss the point of the parable and we're going to make it this emotionalistic, therapeutic application uh, that's really not what's there in scripture. You're, you're not going to fix the problem that way. And, and the reason for that is because I think the church and, and we even as people who see the problem, we look around and we see churches that are dominated by women that are that are more effeminate in their uh, their leadership and in the, the, the men that are there. We see that and we think, OK, the solution is we need masculine stuff. We need to lift weights and we need to eat meat and we need to hike in the woods and shoot guns and change car tires. But none of that is is inherently masculine. What the Bible says about being a man does not include those particular skill sets and activities. What the Bible says being a man is, is, is rooted in Genesis. The man protects, the man cultivates, the man is head over the family, the man represents, the man takes responsibility and blame. Uh, and all of those things, when, when those are theologically applied to us as men, well, guess what skills we develop to be good at those? We learn to provide for our family by hunting. We learn to provide for our family by doing the dirty, difficult jobs that we're hardwired to do, like changing car tires and changing the oil in the car and fixing things. We're going to go out and put ourselves in harm's way because that's how God has wired us as men. And so if you, if you put the cart before the horse, you pursue these masculine activities without having the theological grounding to understand why men are drawn to that stuff, you're probably not going to fix your issue in the church. Well, I think as well with, with the stuff that you're talking about, like I think the way that I've heard it said is moral therapeutic deism. That's what we get from these TED Talk churches. It's just this therapeutic deism that makes you feel decent about your sin. Maybe you'll make some adjustments so that your business can thrive more in the next couple of quarters, but you're not really going to make any substantive life change. And you mentioned there, you know, pastors and churches needing to teach men that they're sinners. Part of the thing is they need to teach women the same thing. Right. One of the things I feel like when we worship at the altar of women during motherhood is we're making them feel that, yeah, your, depra your depravity is different than men's because men's depravity is louder. Typically, it's a little bit more bombastic. It's the same thing like whenever I talk about abortion at churches, it's like you can tell women that have had abortions that they are murderers and at the same time not condemn, condemn them in that exact moment. You're revealing to them the depravity and the level of depravity of their sin so much so that they need a savior to overcome that. But yeah. one thing I jotted down as you were talking is I guess the, the main problem that a lot, most churches have is there is no discipleship. You mentioned that, yeah. that how long were you a Christian before you were discipled? Um, you know, I've gone basically my entire Christian career, as it were, not being discipled by other people. Now, that could be a you problem, certainly, the mm -hmm. you, the collective you, but that can also be a church problem to where it's like, okay, our men aren't volunteering. Our men aren't going on missions. Our men aren't doing this. They're not doing that. It's like, well, are you discipling them to where they would even want to do those things? Or are you producing a, a product, as it were, that may as well be a blinking neon sign that says, yeah. we don't have you in mind. We don't need you because you know this just like I do. Men that don't feel desired and needed will go somewhere where they feel desired and needed, whether that's into the arms of another woman, whether that's to a new job. If on Sunday morning they don't feel like they have a place, then guess what? They're going to feel, as opposed to being in church, they're going to go to the golf uh, the shooting range. They're going to go to the driving range. They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to hit the jujitsu mats. They're going to go do something else. What is, I guess for, in a micro sense, what is your church doing to make sure that men are not falling through the cracks on discipleship? And I guess what would your greater advice be to the pastors listening to this, of which there are several um, to, Hey, let's make sure that we're discipling men so that everything else kind of falls into yeah. place. Uh, yeah. Step one, uh, the primary discipling tool of God's church is the pulpit. So if you're in a church that's not preaching expositionally, and if you don't know what that means, you're probably in a church that's not preaching expositionally. You need to find a church that does so. And, and preaching expositionally just means that uh, the pastor is going to be going through every line of scripture throughout a book of the Bible or, or one, of the, you know, one of the gospels, one of the epistles, one of the prophets, and explaining what the text means verse by verse and then applying that to the hearers, to the congregation. 
And so an easy way to think about it is expositional preaching. The point of the sermon is the point of the text, right? So God is setting the curriculum. God's word is setting the curriculum of the sermons and of that congregational discipleship. The alternative to that is you get a guy who wants to get up and talk about something and he just uses scripture as a way to sort of prop up what he's interested in talking about. Uh, this, you tend to think of them as like topical sermons and topical sermons aren't wrong, but if that's the primary diet of your church, there's a really high risk that you're not applying God's word in any meaningful way to some huge portion of your congregation. Uh, you're only you're only going to be teaching the congregation what the pastor who's preaching wants to talk about and what that pastor thinks. Whereas if you have expositional preaching, then all of the counsel of God's word, which is perfect and applies to men and women as we need from God, then that's going to be fed to them. So that's number one. Number two, uh, individual discipleship. I mean, it's not a program. I see a lot of people say like, yeah, we need discipleship. So they come up with this. 12 week structured book reading thing where that's not, that's not necessarily discipleship. Discipleship just means helping people learn to follow Jesus better. Like mm. so, in our church, we intentionally grab young guys uh, and we grab lunch with them and spend time with them. And, and when we do, we don't waste time talking about foolish stuff of the world. We say, Hey, uh, how are you doing spiritually? Do you want to do you want to grab a book and read it together? And so we have a short list of books that are really easy to read that help people develop and grow in godliness and in maturity and in understanding the gospel. And so we'll read that along with them, grab lunch together again, talk through it. Uh, and, and in that sense, you're opening the door to talk through all sorts of other things as well. Uh, and we found that that to, that to be a really effective thing to build a culture of godly men who are who aren't shy about reaching out and then starting those same discipleship relationships with other men that are coming to the church, doing the same thing that some of, some of the older men did with them. Um, and so, yeah, we, we emphasize that culture of discipleship a lot. It's not a program. It is a culture. So with that culture, there will be things that you should encourage men to do outside the church. One thing that I've encouraged men to do for years and years and years, and tons of guys have, I guess, converted to this, is doing jujitsu. When I talk about jujitsu, because, you know, I'm a purple belt, I've been training for about six years. It's one of those things I've never had a single thing in my life that is as is as difficult and as addictive as jujitsu. Yeah. Because is it physical? Yes. Is it mental? Yes. And that's the thing where you have some people that can dominate physically, but if you're not good mentally, you will not be good at jujitsu. There are people that yeah. can dominate mentally, but if you're not good physically, you will not be good at jujitsu. But we talk about resilience all the time. The thing about jujitsu is it's, it's not the going. That's the problem. It's the coming back, yeah. right? Because yeah. there's a lot of guys that got their white belt and have one stripe on it, right? But then they never got their blue belt or they got their blue belt and then they stopped going. They just, they just got to a certain point and they're like, I'm good. I feel decently dangerous enough. But the real question is, or the real answer is not that they got busy with work. It's not that their family life got out of control. It's that they wussed out. They, they stopped because this is too hard. That It's too difficult. Like, I, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I tell guys, like, jujitsu, if you're able-bodied, like, we have a guy that's in his 50s that just started at our gym about six months ago. Like, if your body works, there's nothing better that I know of on this planet to teach you how to be physically and mentally resilient and perhaps even spiritually resilient than jujitsu. You're a, a uh, yeah. fellow jujitsu practitioner. Talk to me a little bit about that. Like I try not to be romantic about jujitsu, but it's really hard not to be. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Uh, I'm a brown belt. I got my brown belt in 2019. Uh, my senior pastor, Sean, just got his brown belt. Um, I, I, th I think it's fantastic. Um, I think CrossFit does something similar. Um, I like I like to use both of those. I encourage people to do both of those. So, so Sean, my senior pastor, has a two car garage that's a dedicated CrossFit gym, and every member of the church is is welcome to come to group workouts all the time. And we have a lot of people in the church that do. We have jujitsu mats in the upper story of our church building that we we bring guys in who are from the jujitsu school who are maybe they think they're Christians, maybe they know they're not a Christian, but we just bring them in when we drill with them Mondays just to. Uh, just to get more time with them and start to try and provoke spiritual conversation. So we use it as an evangelism tool, but we also use it as a tool for, for men and women in the church, uh, CrossFit and Jiu-Jitsu, 
because a lot of people miss this, but kind of what you said, like there is an element of the physical that overlaps with the spiritual in a really significant way. And I've seen people who struggled spiritually with anxiety and a fear of uh, assurance, like just not having an assurance that, that God really was saving them, that they, you know, their sins were, were truly paid for and just doubting themselves. And you can spiritually counsel somebody like that to death and, and just not get right. anywhere. Suddenly they clean up their diet and they start lifting weights and they're like, wow, I feel good now. I, I trust God. And so there is an interesting spiritual and physical connection where the more physically we're pushing ourselves and gaining confidence and capacity in something like grappling, fighting, or, or CrossFit. Uh, I love the quote from Fight Club. Like Fight Club uh, just turns the volume down on the rest of the world. Mm. There's a very similar effect to training yeah. in difficult physical contexts that suddenly all the other problems that are assailing you just seem a little quieter and, and less of a big deal. Um, and, and there's something to be said for that in terms of spiritual health. You know, I, the, the darkest times I've ever had spiritually is when I couldn't make it to the gym and stopped taking care of my body and stopped eating well. Um, and is that is that a one to one like I was spiritually suffering because I wasn't working out? Probably not. But there's definitely yeah. a connection. So well, there's a contextualization as well with. So whenever I lift and do my workouts and my workouts are, are fairly insane. And when I do jujitsu, it's typically early in the morning. So we have a 545 jujitsu where we roll first. So yeah. we're rolling four or five rounds first and then we drill, right? So it's kind of opposite of how most classes are. Or I'm I'm lifting, you know, squat, deadlift, you know, bench press, you know, pull-ups like that. That's kind of what I'm doing. And then the rest of the day, regardless of what I have to deal with, with the family, with the business, with the podcast, it just seems easier because I've checked the most difficult boxes. Even this morning, Russell, this morning I needed to squat. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to have surgery. And so it's like, okay, I need, I need to knock this out. And it was one of those moments where I just sat on my bench and looked at my squat shoes, my lifting shoes. And I was like, oh, no, I just, no, I just, I can't, I can't today. Mm -hmm. And you know what I did? I put them on and I squatted. Okay. <laughs> and I was just making, that's a daily deposit in the resilience piggy bank to where it's like one of these days I'm going to need to, you know, take some money out of the account and there better be some there. And yeah. so that's what I, I tell guys all the time is it's like, if your life, if the hardest thing you do in life is carry your bucket of balls to the driving range, Man, like I, I, I hate to see when things were to fall apart and I don't mean like global collapse, you know, of yeah. civilization, but it's like, if you need to be resilient, if your wife is so sick that you're, you're trying to consider what life would be like without her and you haven't made those daily multiple times a day deposits in that resilience uh, bank. And that's one of the, the, one of the easiest ways to do that is to exercise really, really, really hard, yeah. not going for a jog, not doing a little light lift or stretching here and there, but really, really getting after it. And man, I feel like you and I could continue talking for the rest of the day today, but I've taken up enough of your time. I got to give some time back to your family. You got stuff you need to be doing, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Yeah, I would just say one last thought uh, is that this is this is probably kind of unique, but there's another ditch you can fall into with pursuing masculine endeavors. And that's kind of going all the way back to where I was before I was a Christian, which was fitter than I've ever been, like constantly lifting weights, successful in my job. Uh, I just got out of the army. I mean, I, I could hike and shoot and, and jump out of planes, do everything. I was, I was as masculine as I could be. And by God's definition, I was not. I was profoundly not masculine because I was uh, making my whole life about me. And I wasn't providing for and, and leading my family spiritually or really in any way. Uh, and, and so, again, like, don't put the cart before the horse. You need both of those things in order to really thrive as a man. I think that's a great, uh, a great word as well, because we're, we're in this kind of we're not in a masculine obsessed culture. We're in the exact opposite. But exactly. for those that are focused on it, it can become an obsession and you want to make sure that you're obsessing over the right foundations and not the mm -hmm. wrong one. So that's a great word to leave yeah. it on. Russell Berger, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thanks, Kyle.
There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Russell Berger. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got a couple links for you today. I've got a link to a Faith Wire article that came out around the time that he was being canceled. And then also I've got a link to his podcast. He has a podcast called Defend and Confirm. Now, this has been dormant for a little bit, but as I understand it, he's going to be resurrecting this here before too long. So uh, before that happens and before they relaunch it, you can go back and listen to the old episode. Episodes. Thank you guys for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is our song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album leveler the links are in the description i'm your host kyle thompson remember keep pushing back darkness keep forging spiritual mental and physical resilience keep seeking the lion of judah <laughs>